All right, back in it. Yeah. Back on the hardwood. Yeah, I feel like this guy was suboned out of some of his uh, potential. Definitely you know? suboned. But we're going to take you to the Sabone zone right now. <laughs> That's right. Just listen to the mustache. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Sports Experience Podcast. I am your co-host, Dom Ditola, sitting alongside my co-host, Chris Quinn. And today, we're back on the hardwood for some yeah. NBA action, as I spoke before. But before we go into it, uh, we're just a couple comics here in Tucson. And uh, if you're interested in stand-up comedy and uh, watching us go on stage and not talk about sports... Chris, where uh, do you perform in town? Do you run any shows? Yeah, I got a show every other Saturday at the screening room. So if uh, if you go down there and it's not that Saturday, then it's next Saturday. Um, <laughs> it's a late night show. We started at 11, and then I do an open mic every single Wednesday if you want to try your hand at the screening room. What yeah. about you? You got something. Yeah, I run an open mic uh, Tony Brune and Roy Lee Reynolds uh, over at uh, the Music Box, east side of town. A uh, nice little dive bar, bomb shelter as far as uh, running material on early Saturdays, 6 p.m. So we'll book you up, up on top of uh, the list if you have later shows. Uh, also, you can uh, catch me on a comedy album that I'm on called Tucson Bullies, where I'm doing about a 20-minute set and uh, probably have another one in the works shortly. And uh, I also perform around Tucson probably four or five times a month as far as book shows. So uh, hit me up on social media at Dom, Ditola Dominic at Sequin Comedy. And then our fearless producer, Ty Engel, in the back, if you just want to check out where we record at Engel Studio yep. in Tucson. And without any uh, other plugs, we're going to get right into this episode. Hell we're yeah. talking about Arvita Sabonis. The Bone Zone. The, the, the Sabone Zone. zone. <laughs> it's perfect. Do you think they called him Boner, like that kid in Growing Pains who was Kurt Cameron's friend before he found Jesus? I hope so, but then he made that growth spurt, and we're just like, no, I was calling you Sabonis the whole time, yep. man. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Kirk. No. Yeah. Um, born December 19th, 1964, and before I go into this, none of us are familiar with Lithuanian, the language or pronunciations. We're trying our best. It's... Uh, Countess Lithuania. I'm going to roll with that. Yeah. Which was then part of the Soviet Union. Um, Arvidas Romas Sabonis was actually lucky to grow up in Lithuania from what we were talking about before. Because of all the Soviet kind of Union countries they gobbled up after the First World War and into World War II, Lithuania, their national sport is basketball. That's right. And it fits him so well that like we'll, we'll a see glove. It. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, if if this was a soccer crazy or a hockey hockey crazy or whatever, you know, in that or region, Chernobyl crazy, you know, but he probably wouldn't have been so successful. But because they were basketball crazy, the Lithuanians definitely. You're gonna find I mean, a place for the seven foot three guy. That's to play. exactly <laughs> like, exactly. You're gonna find a place. Um, so I think he started playing though when he was like 13. Yeah. So you kind of got a later start, much like a David Robinson. But yeah. like, you can't teach height. Like, you just can't teach that. And by 15, he was already part of the Soviet junior national team. And the Soviets, as much as they disliked Lithuanians because of their fierce independence streak um, as a people, they loved having them basically be their national basketball team. They really were. That's they the well that they would draw from for most of that roster. Which, that's kind of how the Soviets did for international... Um, sport was they would just kind of draw from whatever country they were like, well, this country has a really good this. You know what I exactly. mean? Exactly. Kind of like the United States almost. Yeah, we you do know, that. Only a little bit different. But we're we're united. Yeah, we're united. We're totally united. You know, gulags aren't coming anytime soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he starts off his career um, with this team in Lithuania called Zaligris. Is yeah. that right? I don't know. Z Z Zaligris. Yeah, let's go with Zaligris in uh, Countess. Yep. Yeah, so it's his local team. And uh, he turned pro in 1981. He was drafted in the Army, but thanks to his height and his basketball playing ability, they were like, it's cool, bro. Yes. I Which, th this happens in a lot of countries. It happens in uh, Korea. Pro and, cop, remember? Yep. Yeah. And Israel, where they have mandatory um, military service, but you can be excused from it 
you know, if you kick ass at sports. It's a good thing you missed that whole Red Dawn thing that nice. happened. Because this is about the same time. I know. <laughs> Charlie Sheen could have murdered one of the greatest centers in league his in world basketball history. You see that guy? Yeah, the guy that's standing 7'3". We all see him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I even need my sights for this I one? I know. <laughs> just, just start shooting, man. <laughs> yeah, damn. So he turns pro in 1981, so he's 17 years old. Um, like you said, was Zalagris. And uh, he, by the end of his career, um, uh, he wins three straight Soviet Premier League titles from 85 uh, five to 87, and also a 1986 FIBA World Cup. So I, I want to say this. Um, this is when there's these rumors that were going around that the coach of the Soviet Union team, who was also the coach of CSAK Moscow, which was like the biggest club team in Russia. Yeah. After this Lithuanian team won three consecutive soviet titles he was so done with this these players these lithuanian players that he would flat out abuse sabonis in practice a ton which is the saddest thing ever because this dude there's not a lot of film of this because obviously you're not finding fucking anything behind the iron curtain yep. at this juncture but the man is seven foot three while he's kind of skinnier He's like a fucking mix of Dirk Nowitzki and Larry Bird at the same time. Well, he has that touch. He has the pass. And this is something that no big and man... And he could shoot from the outside, which He could just incredible. shoot over anybody because he had a really good three-pointer. When we see him in the NBA, and obviously we're going to talk about it, it's kind of a different player yeah. because he really gets beaten down and really has all these uh, Achilles injuries. It's so, not like Ichiro who comes later, but still in his like his prime. No, you know it's what past I mean? prime this, of a great player. And he's still an exceptional NBA player, yep. but he is like a fucking super freak, you know, playing in Lithuania and playing in Europe for all of these teams because his body hasn't quite been beat to shit yet. Yep. But and, it's starting to, and this is what people were saying as to why, because this coach hated the fact that this little Lithuanian team was coming up and beating the shit out of all the Soviet teams. And then I saw, this was something I didn't know, he was actually drafted by the Hawks in 85. Yeah, before his injury, his before major Before his injury, injury. but they, they, uh, the draft became void because he was actually 20, and there was this weird rule back then that they had to be 21 if they were European. That is... I never even heard of that rule. Europeans can drink at 12. What the fuck? They're an adult at, like, age 13. And if you're from fucking Lithuania, yeah. you've lived nine lives so before the, that point. So the Hawks miss out on it the next... Dude, could you imagine a fucking in his prime Sabonis with Dominique Wilkins? I was just going to say oh, that. Oh, sweet Jesus. So this is the thing that they were saying was, if he came right in this time when he was 20, 21... Whoever, from the Russian whoever coach. he got mixed up with, so it was either the Hawks with Wilkins or Portland, who actually drafts him. With and he Clyde would have been the Glide. He would have been with Clyde the Glide, who had a statement saying that if Sabonis came, we would have been like the Bulls before the Bulls. They would have fucking stuck it up the ass of the Showtime Lakers. They really yes. would have. If no. they had fucking Sabonis playing fucking Kareem. Yep. And this is like old man Roger Murdoch. This isn't fucking, you know, in his prime Kareem. They, and this is what they were saying was, like, we've brought this up with guys before where they get injured and they were like, ah, he could have been. This was the thing where it was like there were people behind the scenes taking his opportunities away. Yeah. So, like, like when, actively trying to ruin this man's career and his life. This and, was a, another one that was unsubstantiated, uh, so there was not technically proof, but supposedly the Russian government was paying this coach to try and deter him from going to the NBA with... <laughs> All kinds of stuff. And the one that I saw was they technically did give a little threaten to his family oh, if Jesus. he was gonna go. So it was one of it was that era, if you know what I, I mean. I must break you. Yes. And we brought this up before where the Soviets hated the Lithuanians in practice. Yeah. And they almost made them be like a practice squad where they would be like all right, Sabonis, you're going to take well, were, uh, charges for an hour. Be like, what? And they were fodder for like injuries. Yep. And that's kind of what happens to Sabonis because his body starts breaking down with like a devastating Achilles injury in 86. Yep. 
And but gotta love that state-run healthcare. He keeps just here, take some Advil, and he just goes out and keeps fucking playing. No, no. So I'll say this: he, he did have surgery, but he comes to America, and the Trailblazers actually do a, a review on his ankle, and they tell the Soviets like it's completely fucked up. He needs to take at least eight month an eight month break, and the Soviets were like, no. Now he's playing next month. And I thought this was so... The Blazers drafted him 21 overall in 86. Yep. So they have his rights now. Yes. And so they that was the thing was, it was so convoluted what his rights were because he was still technically playing in Lithuania. The Soviet Union still was up and running. So they couldn't get him to sign a contract over, but they still wanted him yeah. to not be injured for the rest of his career. Um, I thought it was actually interesting. John... Uh, um, Thompson. Yeah, Thompson. I don't know why. Space. The George. Allen Iverson's coach. Yeah. Yeah. The Georgetown coach was actually the uh, USA's basketball team coach that year. Eighty-eight. And yeah. He talked so much shit on the Trailblazers. They were, he was just like, "You're helping the enemy. You're <laughs> helping the Soviets." And <laughs> it's he, like this guy hates the Soviets more than anybody. Yeah, I know. And the Trailblazers were just like, "No, that's our player. We're just trying to make sure he's not he, going to get injured. He's but alive." To say to for the Soviets like defense on this, I don't think I've ever d defended the Soviets, but for their uh, whatever they did, they went out. They went out and won this uh, '86 FIBA, and they went out and won the '88 gold medal. So, so basically, I wanted to bring this up. Yeah. The 88 Soviet team that won the gold medal, they beat the U.S. in the semifinal game. The U.S. has all amateur players. Granted, some of them are really good, like David, David Robinson, Robinson was, yep. Mitch Richmond. I mean, these good are guys players, in the Hall but of Fame. 20, 20, 21 year olds. Yeah, 21 year olds. Um, and then Soviet Union goes on to beat Yugoslavia, who have like, you know, fucking Vladi Divac and Tony Kukoc and Drazen Petrovic and shit in the gold medal game. The U.S. wins the bronze. That game, the U.S. basketball was like, let's bring in all our big guns next time. Let's bring in one amateur player and the rest, the greatest team ever assembled on a basketball court. Well, that was they didn't want to lose to the Soviets playing our amateurs. Yeah. And, that, and it's pretty Soviets legit. Like playing professionals. Like Sabonis yeah. is like, what, a fucking close to 10-year veteran at this point? No, but I think he's definitely... Yeah, actually, he might yeah, be close. He's like in year eight of his program. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And he and he had. I think he had three consecutive. Um, this was right after he won those titles with Lithuania, and I think he, this is when he had moved to Spain. Right before and, it's right before okay. he moved to Spain. Yeah, uh -huh, to play in the Euro League. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the the Blazers at this point are like, man, we have this fucking unicorn. Just please don't like come to us in one piece. Yeah. And it doesn't end up working out like that because in 1989 he joins. Valladolid in Spain? Yep. Is it Vallado? I don't know. Uh, you, Baxter, you know I don't speak Spanish. Um, he played uh, there from 89 to 92. Um, he won the uh, Liga in that uh, you know specific Spanish league. And then uh, they got to the semifinals of the Korach Cup in 91-92. So he's still enjoying success, and he's still in his late 20s. Yeah. And his body's been beat to shit. But he's still playing really well because he's that gifted of a passer, of a shooter, of a fucking... He even had a good inside game for how big he was. Well, that's what improved later on because he be, started to put on pounds and he yeah. started not to be able to play the way he was early on because his ankles were so messed up. And so, he was rocking the sweetest Eastern block mustache. Oh, my that God. That's oh, the thing. Man. And to be honest, he almost looks like two different players because right? he, he kind of becomes this other type of inside scorer when before he was almost like a, a, a play creator. And that's what they were saying was even late in his career, you could run your entire offense through him. Yeah, because he, like, he could have played, even with his injuries, maybe in this era too, just because of how well he moved the ball. Oh, and without well a doubt. Shoot. Like, yep. He would have been really a good fit in even today's NBA, I which think he would be no big men. Here. I think he would be better in today's yeah, NBA. because he wouldn't have been beat to shit either. Yeah. Like he would have had modern medicine and things like that. <laughs> But uh, in 92, uh, from 92 to 95, he continues playing in Spain, only this time he's in Real Madrid, which, which is, I didn't know had a basketball team. Yeah, well, it's, well, it's their big uh, basketball team out there. Okay. So, like, I think he played for this smaller club 
for I think for two years, and then Real Madrid was like, "Oh yeah, we'll pay you a shit ton of money." What a shit ton of money for that time was, you know. Spanish league titles in ninety three, ninety four, Euro League, FIBA Euro League in ninety five. Uh, in 94 95, uh, in the Spanish league, had 27 or 22.7 points a game, 12.5 rebounds, 2.4 assists, 1.6 steals, and 2.3 blocks. For, for this, he's this just time, filling up the stat sheet. Yes, he was definitely a 20 and 10 guy for like his whole beginning of his career. And they were saying that even in the Lithuania stuff where they don't really have all the statistics, no, he was dropping like seven assists in a game. That was the that <laughs> and was he the was thing doing that, it like with behind the back, yeah. like fucking Harlem Globetrotter shit. That was the most incredible part from what I read about him. Like, holy cow, he was amazing. And that's what so Bill Walton for the for the Blazers at that time said that he saw him in, I think like 84 okay. and said something like, oh, so this guy can pass like bird. This guy is but Larry he's, Bird. Yeah, but he's as tall as I am. And he was talking about how... And Bill Walton was a good passing center. Yes. Yeah. So he he saw what this guy, this kid essentially could do at the time. And then I think he put that in the Blazers being like, yeah, if you could get this guy, do whatever you can to get him. Make him defect, steal him, whatever. But That's uh, what he said. He was like, oh, we should have had a plan to uh, kidnap him and bring him over. Right? <laughs> I saw Detlef Shrimp actually said that if he had come over in his prime, if he had played in his 20s, yeah. he thought he could have been the greatest player of all time. I don't agree with that. I, I, I'm just saying that that's what Detlef Shrimp said. Probably top 10 or top 20. He could. I, mean, I, I think he could have been top three center, which is yeah. fucking wild. We Considering the fucking centers that he played against yep. and held his own against even in his old age. like. But uh, end of 94-95 season, he finally gets to go to Portland. Finally for the 95-96 season. And there was a story where the general manager, Bob Whitsitt, um, the guy who I think it's the same guy who didn't draft Michael Jordan. Yeah, I think um, so. Uh, he took a look at his physical with the doctor, and the doctor said he could have qualified for the handicap parking spot on the X-ray alone. So his feet, his ankles, and then now his up into Achilles. his back. Yeah, his back is given is out now. Is completely done. So like, just to put it in perspective, and this was my favorite thing about the GM because they were like, uh, "We want to look at this X-rays to make sure we want to sign him." And he's like, "Oh, this handicapped gentleman, you're gonna <laughs> sign him? Like, literally, you could have been like, oh, he has a alien inside of him, and he's gonna birth him.' And he's just like, oh yeah, we're still gonna sign him." <laughs> Still going to put him he out there. still help our team. Yeah, he's still going to help our team. He's I mean, not dead. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Wheel him out there. Um, so it's just one of those funny times where you're just like... can use the cane to poke people. But So uh, 95, 96, what did he do well, out and do? I just want to say this. He was drafted a decade, decade yeah. before oh, he God. actually got to play. Isn't that insane, Which, dude? yeah, it sucks. And it sucks because he oh. would have got drafted on a great Blazers team. He gets put onto a mediocre Blazers team. Yeah, this is like the Blazers post that finals run where they had against Jordan. Um, they're making the playoffs every year, but they're basically exiting in the first round or sometimes at best second round. Well, it's it's Damon Stoudemire at the... Not yet. Not yet? Okay. It's later because they have okay. Kenny Anderson still. Oh, they we still... We should do oh. a fucking episode on him. That yeah. guy is wildlife. But um, 95, 96, he's all rookie. Mm-hmm. He's an all rookie at 31, 32. Yeah. Runner up in the rookie of the year to and runner uh, AI. Up. Yep. I think, yeah. And runner up uh, six man. Oh, no, not a- AI was the following season. Okay. But, uh, I saw he was runner up six man because yeah. they, they wanted to bring him off the bench and people are like, why wow, he's so good? And there's like, he's well, they did so that, injured. But you know what? They did that unlike the fucking Islanders did with Mike Boss. They were unable to do with Mike Boss. Yeah. yeah. They actually were like, okay, we're going to roll him out about 20 minutes a game off the bench he'll provide great minutes and we'll keep him fresh to where he can play in a shit ton more games uh, and play in the games that are important and that's the thing that kind yeah. of rings true i'll tell you what's interesting about his basketball iq where they were talking about european players at this time when they would come in they would need two or three years to because the american game was so different it was so much more physical because we're still talking only iso fucking yep. adrian dantley style basketball yes you know more physical defense like Tony Kukoc would always talk about how like basically those Bulls teams his first few years would bully the shit out of him yep. to make him tougher because well, 
And the thing about Sabon- Sabonis coming in was he literally fit in right away because he could and understand. He's already tough. He's already a grown. He's already man. tough, and his basketball basketball IQ is like through the roof. So he just understood immediately, like, oh, this is a tougher game. I'm gonna adapt my my game a little bit for it. And he was. This is why I think he could have been one of the best centers of all time. Oh, I, absolutely. It, it's just it sucks that what happened to him in his 20s. Yeah, but I mean, his first year he goes out, 14 and a half points a game, 8.1 rebounds, a career high 54.5 field goal percentage. And in the playoffs where they lose in five games when it was a five game series in the opening yep. round, they lose to the fucking Jazz. He averages over almost 24 points a game and over 10 rebounds. And that was a great Jazz team. It was yeah. Carl Malone, it was a John, John Stock, Stock, so a lot of other doofy looking white guys. Yep. Uh, but uh 96 97, he starts 68 of 69 games, 13.4 points, almost 8 rebounds. But again, they lose in four games in the playoffs to the Lakers and Shaq. And to the eventual domination of the what the Lakers bring. Yeah. But, and this is the thing that I feel like sometimes is teams aren't built for playoff runs, and this Blazers team was just not built for that. When, and, when you look at the West at that time, yep. I think one thing we need to bring up is it's wide open every fucking year, really until Shaq gets there and then later Tim Duncan. Anybody could fucking win at any given time. You'd see the Jazz, you'd see the Sonics, you'd see the Suns. Like you have all these teams kind of just shuffling around, yeah. waiting and asking to have their asses beat. And the Rockets had those two titles in there, but like waiting to get their asses beat by whomever came out of the Eastern Conference, which fucking Michael Jordan, like in the Bulls. And that's what, and I'll reiterate this again if he had come in his 20s, the West was literally wide open. The balance of power would have so shifted. Yeah. Like we're talking about the Showtime Lakers maybe being denied one, if not maybe two titles, you know. But, uh, Nah, 97, 98. He has a career high in points per game. Mind you, he's like 34 yep. at this time. And completely, this was the other thing that they were talking about was it looked like two different players when he was running up the court because before it would look like a normal, like small forward running up the court. And now it looks like he's like Fucking carrying. lurch from the Adams Yes, family. he's carrying cement shoes and he's just like, ugh, ugh, ugh. why am I doing this? Oh yeah, the money. But no, uh, the career high points per game. He has 10 rebounds a game three assists and he's averaging 32 minutes a game yep it's amazing it's just a damn shame they lose the lakers again yeah i know and he's still fighting through all these injuries he's still playing significant minutes and he's still producing and you're watching this going like i I mean i wasn't watching this at the time but looking back you're just like god what if yeah he could have been like a 2015 guy with maybe five assists like it would have been like almost a fucking small forward playing center. Yes, and this is the other thing is I feel I feel like if he came in that early time when he was facing the basket, he would have really changed the game and showed all these centers that like hey, you can launch threes because nobody's going to go up and block them. So just like yeah, it's who's there get for face? you. Yeah. yeah. And exactly. you, and you're drawing the center out. Like there's all these things that they do and because in the he was modern a good passer, game. He could move the ball as he draws the fucking yep. attention away. Like yep. no, it, it's sad to think what we got to see of him because literally we can't even like find footage of him in Lithuania's like shit. But like what we see of him is technically different style player, and he's still amazing. Still good. Yeah, yeah, he's still a good player. Uh, 98, 99, uh, this is when they really, this is when they have a really good team. This is when... All okay, the this pe- is when Damon this Stoudemire, is when Damon comes, Stoudemire comes, Rasheed Wallace. Rasheed Wallace, yep. Isaiah Ryder, and then uh, Bryant Grant with his dreadlocks yep. uh, helping him rebound on the inside. Um, they were the number one team in the West for most of the season. San Antonio had a ridiculous run that year to... Uh, finish 37 and 13. The Blazers finished 35 and 15. So they were the number two seed in the Western Conference. And this is a strike shortened year. Oh, obviously. yes, yes. So um, they sweep the Suns in the first round. Then they take out the defending um, Western Conference champion Jazz in six games in the next round. And then they're swept by the Spurs when they get to the Western Conference Finals. And this is that Spurs domination yeah, this Beginning. is yeah, this is where it kind of falls apart for Portland because now you see the transition from the Trailblazers into the Jailblazers. Yep. 
And this, I believe, was a team Jermaine O'Neal was on. Oh, yeah. And then we talked about in our yeah, Malice Yeah, dang. Still had a good year. 12.1 points a game, 7.9 rebounds, and uh, 10 and almost 9 in the playoffs. But, like I said before, 35 years old. 35 years old, and they were talking about when – when he really started to hit these injuries, 28, 29, he looked like he could, re- they were like, oh, he could retire the next year. And then he played five years in the NBA, which is played, like, yeah, like it's pretty fucking ridiculous when yes. you think about and it. And he played a shit ton of minutes. Like outside of that first year, he played, they needed he was him. there, he was their <laughs> starting center and he was their best player. So it's just, yeah. The following season, they get even better. They add um, Scotty Pippen and Steve Smith. Oh yeah, to their Scottie, team. Yeah, and Sabonis is still putting good stuff, uh, good numbers up, twelve and almost eight as far as points and rebounds. And uh, they finish with fifty nine and twenty three record and get the number three seed. Yes. And this is looking like it could be their year because they beat Kevin Garnett and the T Wolves in the opening round. They beat the j- number two seeded Jazz in five games to oh, yeah. set up another postseason matchup against the Lakers and this could have been one of the most incredible comebacks in playoff history they're down three to one in the series and they win game five games five and six to set up the the game seven game seven at Staples Center which they're winning most of this goddamn game they had it in the bag aren't they up like 15 with like eight minutes left something something? ridiculous the Lakers I think had a 15-0 run in the fourth quarter and it's that famous shot of uh uh, Kobe Alley being it to Shaq to kind of seal the game where it's like, fuck what could have been. Cause if they go to the finals that year, they play the Pacers and who knows what happens. Yeah. That, that would have been an interesting matchup to that Pacers team. Um, but he said this, he said, that was one of the worst losses of my career. And like, he's like, as a professional, you have like three or four losses where you're just like that was horrible and that was the one where he said because i felt like he's still seeing visions of that like fucking he has ptsd from uh soviet practices in this game yes because i and this is like you were saying like i felt like he thought that this was our best chance to be champions we could have gone in and beat the the pacers and it just didn't work out for him that's the that's the other thing that kind of sucks is it just like he was this what if story. Yeah, the next two years um, kind of starts declining as far as playing time. Numbers not too bad, but he, his body's failing. His body's That's failing. Just flat out, what's happening? Yeah, um, he uh, 2000 2001. You know, plays ten points a game, over five rebounds. Then he retires, thinking he'll play for uh, Zalagrass. Yeah, Zalagrass or, or whatever uh, in uh, Lithuania, but. He's injured again. Yep. He can't even play for him. He said, too, he was like, I'll go and play like 50% of the games and like playoff games. Yeah. And he ends up getting injured and can't play the entire season. So And it sucks. He comes back the next year for the Blazers, but only starts one game and is averaging 15 minutes. Yeah. And it's kind of, that's it for him because he goes back in 03, 04 to uh, Zalgris and still plays pretty well. He's age 40 almost 17 points and over 10 rebounds a game yeah he wanted like, to retire with them which i thought was awesome which is nice it's your yeah. hometown team and you're a fucking legend there i mean why not um definitely uh improved the team with his presence there but uh yeah his he we were we as fans were robbed but more than anything he was robbed yep he was fucking robbed of showing the world he was basically playing 2020s basketball in 19 Eight, the 1980s. Yeah, late 80s. In the um, early 80s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to bring up this story. I kind of forgot about it. 92, Lithuania breaks off from Soviet Union, and they're finally able yeah, to... Yeah, they the Olympics. They are finally able to go under their own flag, but they didn't have any money. Guess who gave them the money? And... There is a documentary out there. It's I th- really good. I think it's called The Other Dream Team yep. or something uh-huh. something like that. And The Grateful Dead, the band. And Bill Walton. <laughs> Bill Walton, with with The Grateful Dead behind him, flies in and sponsors the Lith- Lithuania team. And they are in full-on tie-dye. tie-dye. Oh, God, and dude, it's, it's brilliant. It's not even just tie-dye. It's tie-dye like shirts, like not jerseys. Warm-ups, yeah. Warm-ups. And just like they look 
amazing. And I think they won the bronze medal. They that go year. on to win the bronze medal yeah. because Lithuania was Soviet Union's basketball team, and, and they I were beat like Russia in that tournament yep. too, which had to be just like ah, awesome. Fuck you. I love that shit. Know, right? That's the that's the kind of stuff I love from international sport where you get that you're just like yeah you guys fucked us over for 40 years but we just beat you in basketball so. yeah it's, how do you like them apples or how exactly. do you like them t- how do you like them turnips okay. applesauce <laughs> uh one uh, another story from him in the blazers locker room this was definitely the uh bad boy blazers if you will um <laughs> there was somebody that was running off at the mouth he said he was definitely not one of the bigger guys you know yeah um, the, the guy who told this story, he was just like, I'm not going to say who this guy was, but he was running off at the mouth about Sabonis fucking not doing some defensive thing. And he was oh, like, no. if you want to fucking get tough. And Sabonis just looked at him and goes, I will kill you. And the guy shuts up <laughs> so fast. He was just like, oh, I, I didn't, I thought we were talking shit. When and an Eastern European person says that to you, it puts the fear of God into you. Yep. That was the other thing was he had these gigantic hands and oh, my God. favorite quote was he had a keg for a head. Yeah, so it was no, just he, he had like that almost huge. Frankenstein look. Yes. Which I, it's not nice, but like it's kind of what you equate it to. <laughs> not to be mean, but like no, it's just it's, this large yeah. fucking man. Yeah. Um his uh three sons, three all sons play basketball. One of them uh is a two time all star, DeMontis, who plays for the uh Pacers. Uh, Pacers now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were talking about this. If uh, if you're a white basketball player, the Pacers are going to fucking gobble you up, man. I mean, they need it. So <laughs> After Malice at the Palace. Yeah, they, they, saw, they saw Sabonis coming through, and they were like, all right, he's actually a really great player. No, Smart, he is really yeah. good. Yeah, I think he, he was the one that played at Gonzaga, I think. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah, but he, Arvita Sabonis, 2011, Naismith Basketball Hall of Famer. Um, like I said, shame we were robbed of what he could have been, but a legend in Lithuania and yeah. she could have been an even bigger NBA legend. Yeah. And could have changed the game. That's something else that people were saying was he was this style that we see now. Oh and yeah. Yeah. Totally. He was great. Thank you all. Mm-hmm.